Hello, I'm Ashok Khosla and you're watching The Green Show. Each week, our program brings to you the latest information on how the new and growing concern for environmental issues can impact the business community. Problems of air and water pollution, waste disposal and resource depletion are clearly going to pose many constraints on corporate activity. But equally, there are numerous opportunities for new sources of earning as well. In the next decade, business profits and indeed business survival will largely depend on how accurately the enterprise can see these new opportunities and on how quickly it can move into them. Our job at The Green Show is to help you stay right up there on the front line of environmental knowledge. In this episode of The Green Show, rag picking in Delhi, to ban or not to ban? Are rag pickers a social nuisance, spreading garbage and creating disease, or are they the lifeline of a city? You may ignore rag picking as an activity, but can you afford to ignore it as an issue? Then we visit the tribal areas of Madhya Pradesh to witness the people's participation movement. At a time when most efforts at forest conservation are turning into conflicts between man and nature, Bandhavgarh and Chabua could show us a way out. And finally, a look at an age-old vehicle. Can it still work as a modern mode of transport? A report on why you should pick up again the good old habit of cycling. Rag picking and sorting garbage is one of the largest sources of employment for children in India's cities. In Delhi, for instance, it employs nearly one lakh people and it is the fourth largest vocation for children. But everyone knows that children should be at school and child labor must be abolished. But what about the adult rag pickers? A recent ban by the municipal corporation is threatening to put an end to all these livelihoods and create a mass of uncollected garbage throughout the capital. What precisely are the issues and how can solid waste be better managed? Muhammad Hassan is nearly 60 years old. Less than a year ago, he came to Delhi to try and earn his living. Today, he has a profession that few would like to choose. Every day when this large metropolis is lost in its own chaos, this man rummages through its garbage, looking for things that he can sell for food. But Hassan has not been a rag picker all his life. Before coming to Delhi, he had worked as a cycle mechanic. Though Hassan has known more respectable ways of earning his livelihood, there are others who have been doing this for almost as long as they can remember. Among them is Usman. He's not even sure about his age. 10 or 11 maybe, he says, but certainly he's mature far beyond his years. Usman's younger sister, Saira, also works with him. In fact, his entire family does. A family of four fatherless children and a middle-aged mother. Rabia Khatun has had a hard life. Today, with four children to feed, she has little time to ponder over good and bad. <laughs> Rabia Khatun and her family are not the only ones. In Delhi alone, there are nearly one lakh rag pickers who scavenge for food. Then there are many more who are involved at various stages, like assorting and selling whatever can be recycled. Together, they form a long chain, a chain of people who survive on a city's waste. Oh, think twice, it's Now, the Municipal Corporation of Delhi, MCD, has imposed a ban on rag picking. For lakhs of people, their only source of livelihood is threatened. Our children are four, three girls and three girls. And 
हम एक कमाने वाला है अगर ये काम रुक जाएगा तो हमारी खाना भी कुछ कम हो जाएगा परेशानी हो जाएगा हम लोग का फिर क्या होगा उससे गरीबी बढ़ेगी बेरोजगारी बढ़ेगी क्यों आजकल रोजगार बी ए पढ़े एम ए पढ़े को नहीं मिलता है ये तो अनपढ़ है ये कागज बीन करके अपना गुजारा करते हैं अगर इस पर भी रोक लगा दी जाएगी कल को चोरी करेंगे क्रिमिनल बनेंगे The ban was imposed in November last year after the outbreak of plague. Its immediate aim was to prevent further spread of the disease and to protect the rag pickers who were obviously at high risk. As the scare died out, rag picking increased again. But plague was not the only reason for imposing the ban. The MCD feels that the rag pickers are a social nuisance, a civic menace that needs to be contained. A decision uh, of course uh, was to be taken whether Uh, we should have a country where there they are rag pickers and uh, whether the nuisance which they create in rag picking uh, that should allowed to be corrected. what kind of nuisance social nuisance. or otherwise social and even otherwise because uh, whenever they do rag picking they just try to spread the garbage uh, While the MCD chooses to condemn rag picking, it turns a blind eye to its own inefficiency. Delhi generates about 5000 metric tons of garbage every day. The MCD disposes only two thirds of it. About 20 to 30 percent of our garbage is handled by rag pickers. The garbage that they pick is nearly one lakh truckloads per year. मेरी रोजी रोटी की बात की बात है वो। अगर ये जब अगर ये गंदगी बढ़ेगी तो आपको बीमारी फैलेगा और ये म्यूनसिपैलिटी कॉरपोरेशन के पास है इतना आदमी है कहाँ लेवर जो ये सफाई करने वाला मीन वाइल मैनी एन जी ओज एंड एक्टिविस्ट हैव कम फॉरवर्ड टू सपोर्ट द रैक पिकर्स अमंग दैम इज भारती चतुर्वेदी हु इज लॉन्च टू सिग्नेचर कैंपेन अगेंस्ट द बैम बी एम सी डी फील दैट विदाउट द रैक पिकर्स गार्बेज मैनेजमेंट वुड बी मच ईजियर एंड दे थिंक इट्स ईवल ऑलमोस्ट Uh, I I don't quite agree with it because I think banning them won't help. I think we need to imp- we need to change the way our solid waste management is functioning. And I think rag pickers are feeding off a particular way in which we are disposing our garbage, throwing it into open bins or these huge room like bins. So they're feeding off a system. So you need to rectify the system. Let's take a closer look at the system. Every day the MCD collects about 1000 truckloads of garbage. This is brought to the sanitary landfill sites. Here the garbage is leveled, sprayed with insecticides and finally covered with rubble. Once a landfill is exhausted, it can be turned into a park like this one. But dumping first and greening later does not solve the problem. Garbage like plastic bags does not decompose for years and continues to pollute the earth beneath its surface. Furthermore, the MCD does not pick out the garbage which can be recycled. and this is where the rag pickers are of crucial importance ki corporation ki gaadi aati hai ek trip usme lagana hai kitna bhi kooda hai jitna uska gaadi mein aaya utna le jayegi baaki ka chhod jayegi to usme jo mota kooda hota hai wo to dab jata hai lekin ye jo kagaz mummi jo hota hai ye to loop karke fir apni jagah par pahunch jata hai to isko chunne wale chunte hain aur chun usko chunne se kai aadmiyon ka rozi ka zariya chalta hai there is another problem with dumping Every year the MCD requires about 100 acres of new land but there is simply no land at all so is it only a matter of time before the garbage starts piling up on our streets we can rest assured for another 10 15 years there is enough land <laughs> there is enough land. <laughs> the last uh, thing i will like will take, take you to the 21st century <laughs> <laughs> Is this the way we want to enter the 21st century? With ambitions of soaring high while ignoring the ground reality of our ill-planned development, we need to take a serious look at our solid waste management programs. In many developed countries like Japan, incinerators are used to burn the garbage and to generate energy. India's first and only incinerator was set up in Delhi with a cost of 20 crore rupees. It was shut down 2 years ago for technical reasons. Developing countries also have source segregation schemes under which people are paid for picking out recyclable material in their homes. In our country there is no such scheme as yet, only a suggestion 
which is being considered. There could be yet another way out. Instead of imposing a ban, perhaps MCD needs to integrate the adult track pickers into the system. Perhaps they could be given some training and some implements. This way they could help recycling while earning their own living. Has the MCD given it a thought? I don't think it, uh, it, it is a function which the Call Commission has to discharge. It is not a function, but perhaps it is a matter of an outlook. Uh, if corporation can take up upon itself to suggest but a plan... Every, but for everything you need money, where the money is going to come. The choice lies between a ban and awareness, between chaos and planning. The message is simple. While we need to wean away the children from this form of child labor, we must integrate the adults into our system, a system which in any case cannot function without them. Through the ages, people have learned to coexist with animals and plants. They evolved patterns of life that permitted a reasonable sharing of the Earth's resources with all other species on our planet. Ill-planned development has not been able to stop the depletion of our national resources. Efforts to conserve forests have turned into a conflict between man and nature. But there are ways to save forests without displacing the indigenous people. In fact, the need for jobs can also be fulfilled at the same time. Here is a success story that brings people and jobs together without destroying the environment. <laughs> For centuries of forest feeds and shelters its natives, then one day it is declared a national park. Wildlife and forest conservation sets in Naturally, there is resentment from the natives. Resources become inaccessible and they are forced to move on. Sometimes the cost is extinction. Even if the tribals survive, they exploit the forest elsewhere and the problem continues. Perhaps forest conservation is becoming a vicious cycle. A typical example is Bandhavgarh National Park. It is a part of Shehdol district of Madhya Pradesh. More than half of Shehdol's population is tribal. The Baiga tribe has thrived on Bandhavgarh forest through the centuries. Bandhavgarh was declared a national park in 1968, but the Baigas continued to live off the forest, and the efforts at conservation failed repeatedly. Bandhavgarh became yet another scene of a man-nature conflict, a classic catch-22 situation. Either the forest or the tribals had to die to save the other. But perhaps there was a way out. Perhaps if one could involve the tribals in conserving the forest. The first step towards a solution was taken last year. The forest officials took the initiative and went to the Baigas. Gradually, the communication gap was bridged. Trust lost over the years was regained. जैसे आप जीप से अगर गांव में जाते हैं तो उसी समय दूरी बढ़ जाती है जब भी आप जाएं जीप कम से कम एक दो किलोमीटर दूर खड़ा करें पैदल जाएं आप गांव में आप गांव वालों के साथ बैठे हैं अगर वो जमीन पे बैठे तो आप भी बैठिए अगर आप अच्छा पैंट और टाई पहन के गए और आपने सोचा कि हमें तो चारपाई और कुर्सी पे ही बैठना है फिर वो विश्वास की दूरी बढ़ने लगती है वंस द आइस वाज ब्रोकन द बाइगर्स अंडरस्टूड द सिचुएशन द ट्राइबल्स वर रेडी टू शिफ्ट बट नॉट टू चेंज द अथॉरिटीज सेट आउट टू आइडेंटिफाई सूटेबल साइट्स विद सिमिलर लिविंग कंडीशंस सही विकास वाला गांव कैसा गांव मानते हैं आप विकास वाला जैसे स्कूल है और मान लो बिजली है और ये जैसे जानवरों की कुछ रक्षा हो जाए रुंधाई बंधाई हो जाए ताकि हम बाल गोपाल जो गल्ला फसल बोमे तो हम ताकि पालने पूरा अपन बाल गोपाल जिला खबा सके बाल पोषण कर लें टुडे अ ईयर लेटर आइडियल साइट्स हैव बीन आइडेंटिफाइड एंड रिहैबिलिटेशन वर्क इज इन प्रोग्रेस the baigas are being provided not only with similar living conditions but also with new means of employment now they do not have to depend on the forest alone they are being trained in carpet weaving and sericulture 
Special loan schemes have also been floated. The enterprising buyers are responding well. The tribals have come forward to help conserve the forest. They have formed forest protection committees with the forest guards. Their task is to avert forest fires, prevent grazing, poaching and felling. In return, the tribals earn 30% of the forest income. The forest guards are happy too. Performing routine duties had never been this easy before. Bandhagarh is not an isolated success story. The case of Jhabua district in Madhya Pradesh itself is another example. Jhabua is a mountainous district with 6,800 square kilometers of undulating land. Nearly one-fifth of the land is under forest cover. But there is a problem. 80% of the forest is degraded. As a result, the rainfall is as low as 828 millimeter per year. This leads to soil erosion. The groundwater retention is low and forest conservation is an uphill task. Soil erosion, which threatens Jabua's forest cover, also poses a threat to its people. Jabua's 83.5% population is tribal. It comprises two tribes, the Bheels and the Bhilalas. Due to soil erosion, the tribals could manage just one crop a year. They lived in extreme poverty and faced problems of sustenance. The magnitude of soil erosion in Jabua was enormous. As groundwater retention was very low, most of the tube wells did not function. The crop was poor and the cattle grazed off the little grass that grew. But like Bandhavgarh, people's participation schemes were tried here as well. The task was cut out. Check soil erosion and aid groundwater retention. But obviously, the question was how to do it. Anna Sahab Hazare's model village, Ralegaon Siddhi, had an answer. This Maharashtrian village has developed indigenous low-cost techniques. These are now being used in Jhabua. Four meter wide and 10 feet deep trenches are dug around the tube wells. Rainwater, which was drained off the slopes, now fills these trenches, bringing up the underground water table. Natural ditches in the area also fill up, resulting in ponds. These ponds are then leased out to the villagers, and prawn farming has emerged as a major source of alternate employment. Now the Bheels and Bhilalas reap one crop in the fields and another in the ponds. Cooperative conservation is showing results. Water distribution issues are now being handled by the Pani Panchayats. Villagers have even agreed to sell most of their cattle. The reduction in cattle population has checked overgrazing, which in turn has checked soil erosion. Bandhavgarh and Jhabua have set examples, examples of alternate sustainable development, examples of people's participation movement. The Baigas, the Bheels and the Bhilalas of Madhya Pradesh are leaders of a new revolution, a revolution which is green at its very roots. The number of automobiles on the roads of Delhi has doubled in the last five years. This has caused a tremendous rise in the poisonous fumes emitted by the city's traffic. In a big city like Delhi, which incidentally has more cars than Calcutta, Bombay and Madras put together, this has caused a major problem of air pollution. Dangerous chemicals like lead have gone up in certain places by as much as 18 times the permissible levels. One simple way of cutting down on vehicle pollution is to use bicycles. This is not only environment friendly, but also leads to a healthier life.
cycle once and you will never forget it. Have you ever tried cycling just for pleasure? No ignition trouble, no bothering about tanks going empty. The best part is you'll never be chalant for emitting more smoke than you're permitted to. There's more than this a cycle brings you. Let's take a look first at the cycle statistics in India. Approximately 9.6 million cycles are manufactured every year in the country. India is the third largest producer of cycles in the world, China and Japan occupying the first and second positions respectively. Health clubs recommend cycling as one of the best forms of physical exercise. It keeps the body fit and the doctors away. If you've got to develop stamina, strengthen and tone your limb muscles, cycling is an ideal choice. Cycling is also an international sport. In the highly competitive world of this grueling sport, Pullworth holds the national record for speed. He practices along with the other members of the national cycling team. They cycle, would you believe it, 80 kilometers every day. Let's ask what cycling means to them. Stamina भी मनता है, body मजबूत भी होता है, body एकदम fit होता है, कुछ बीमारी ऐसा नहीं होता, बीमारी बैठा नहीं होता, एकदम fit रहता। A bicycle fits in as the best mode of transport, considering India's socio-economic status. However, in India, regular cycles are mostly used by the lower income strata. Invariably, its use as a mode of transport and not just for pleasure or exercise has put its user in the lower income category. Meet Ramesh. He cycles every day from his home in a village on the outskirts of Delhi. He earns enough to afford a scooter or a motorbike. But Ramesh prefers cycling 12 kilometers to his office located in a commercial center in South Delhi. This he has been doing for the past eight years. 25 minutes is what Ramesh takes to reach his office. He feels the bus takes more time to travel the same distance due to ever-increasing traffic. Leave aside the time lost in waiting for it. On a cycle, he doesn't have to worry about missing his bus or getting stuck in a traffic jam. Besides, he knows that it is good for his health. Unfortunately, cyclists in India face major problems. Pollution, increase in traffic, absence of separate cycle tracks, signals and parking spaces. In Delhi alone, the number of motorized vehicles has risen from 5 lakhs in 1981 to 24.14 lakhs in 1994. With this, there has been an obvious increase in air pollution of Delhi. It has the dubious distinction of being the world's third most polluted city. Under such circumstances, encouraging cycles seems to be an obvious alternative. China, Japan, USA and Netherlands have worked out facilities for their cyclists. They have separate cycle tracks and traffic signals. Parking spaces at the railway stations and bus stands enable them to cycle at least a part of their way to work. The situation is a complete reversal in India. Delhi, for instance, in its master plan, is supposed to have cycle tracks on at least five major roads. Separate traffic signals for cyclists are also there, but only on paper. None of these plans ever materialized, even though Delhi has an estimated 1.5 million cycle users. The master plan roads are under construction. Somewhere the development work is going on. At some of the places, the problems are on account of the encroachment of the land. The right of way is available. Uh, it has been given in the master plan, but much of it, it has been occupied by the encroachers. The situation continues to worsen. Out of 207 fatal accidents last year in Delhi, more than 10% were cycle accidents. And out of 809 accidents that left people injured, more than 9% again were cycle accidents. This is clearly unfortunate. Cycle industry in India has tremendous potential in the future. It is the fourth largest user of cycles in the world as against the second largest population. 
Take another look at what you thought was a slow, boring vehicle. The cycle is economical, it is healthy and it is green. High time we take cycles seriously. The environment is everybody's business. No one will be immune to the consequences of a breakdown of our life support systems. Each one of us must now stand up and be counted in the defense of the earth against the massive onslaught of mankind's greed and hunger for more and more. Business earnings must increasingly come from quality rather than quantity, from better rather than bigger, and from adding value rather than extracting resources. Installing pollution control equipment Bicycling to work or saving paper are not the only ways to protect the environment. Businesses can contribute to the future of the planet in many more sophisticated ways by the choice of technology, the choice of location, and even the choice of product mix. Your concern is our inspiration. 